Okay. Uh, thank you very much for inviting me. And uh, it's such a pleasure to uh, be here in such a wonderful place, which is uh, growing and it grows steadily, wonderfully, as beautifully as the surroundings. And uh, I'm very happy to be here to talk to you. Now, my talk is going to be like a tour. You know, it's going to be like a tour to a very complicated forest with uh, hillsides and mountaintops. Uh, we cannot see a lot of stuff there. But uh, it won't, it won't uh, deal with a lot of details. So we'll have a talk in which uh, everybody can take something home. Okay, hopefully. All right, so uh, I have uh, sort of uh, in the beginning planned a historical talk that uh, Galileo, who pioneered the modern scientific method, one of those who pioneered the modern scientific method, discovered a new law of gravity. And this new law is, uh, what everybody knows, is that gravity acts in the same way on all bodies. They all fall in the same way, independent of their mass, right? We all study that right in the beginning. Now, there's a very fundamental law of nature, actually, and it's uh, verified to a precision of one part in 10 to the 13. And it plays a key role in Einstein's theory of general relativity. This free fall experiment is, uh, it's, Galileo, I don't think, did this experiment. I think he arrived at this by theoretical reasoning, but some other people tested it later on. This is just a cartoon. The next player in our story is... Uh, Isaac Newton, uh, who uh, <clears throat> establishes a framework for mechanics and the mathematical foundation of uh, physics in some sense. And uh, Newton formulated the laws of motion in terms of the flow in time of the position of a point particle in three dimensions. We all know that, right? But at that time, it was a very big step actually to be able to describe motion in terms of three numbers which are a function of time. So here we have a simple dynamics uh, being uh, combined with geometry. You see, there's a play of geometry and dynamics all the time. This is the first instance of it. And you know that velocity and acceleration are given by one and two time derivatives of it. So you have a lot of curvature. The acceleration is a lot. You know very well if you come from Trivandrum to this place <laughs> that curvature and acceleration are related. <clears throat> okay, so there is one very, very important tenet of Newton's law and that time is absolute and uh, the same for all observers. Okay, so now the point is that this is something we take for granted in our everyday life. Uh, we all share the same clocks, the same time, wherever we are, however fast we are moving in trains, cars, etc. Uh, but we'll come to this, how to, this is not true really, we'll come to it a bit later. And this is of course Newton's law, famous Newton's law that force is proportional to acceleration and uh, you have an inertial here. But m inertial is the same as n gravity, so force is equal to uh, <clears throat> m gravity times uh, acceleration. Now we come to the one of the main points. So this also you all know. So I'm telling you things you all know, and we'll slowly go from there. Okay. So I take two masses you know very well at a distance r from each other, and they attract. Okay. By this inverse square law. Okay. Now, <clears throat> there is something about this law which bothered Newton a lot. Most of us never got bothered by it when we studied it. It's amazing. And uh, what is the problem that was bothering Newton? That if you take two masses, okay, and you, uh, you shift this a little bit, this mass will instantaneously react to it. it means it's instantaneous. And that's where the problem is. And Newton was amazed. It's amazing that, you know, he was really aware of it. So I've just some quotes from here. These slides will be with you so you can look at it a bit later on. And uh, so I just want to read this out. I have not yet been able to discover the cause of these properties of gravity 
from phenomena and I feign no hypothesis. It is enough that gravity does really exist and acts according to the laws I have explained and that is abundantly serves to account for all the motions of celestial bodies. That this law, put it in the in Newton's second law, calculate, then it accounts for celestial motions. So it's a, it's a practical thing he did actually, but there was a problem behind uh, that was not satisfying Newton, and we'll see that is uh, this problem get resolved is gets resolved in the general theory of relativity of Einstein. Okay. All right. So. Now we jump uh, many years ahead from Newton, we come to the uh, middle of the 19th century and this is, uh, <coughs> this is James Clerk Maxwell. Uh, Maxwell uh, lived only 48 years, do you know? And how much he achieved in those 48 years is amazing actually. Uh, and so Maxwell unified electricity and magnetism and predicted the existence of electromagnetic waves and identified light as an electromagnetic wave of oscillating electric and magnetic fields moving with the speed of light. Now, this is a big, very big step in the history of science because it firstly unifies electricity, magnetism and optics. Okay? And it makes a very important prediction that uh, you know light travels at a finite speed, finite speed and it is uh, composed of oscillating electric and magnetic fields. Now, you might think that this uh, was pulled out by Maxwell from his head. Certainly, a lot came from Maxwell, but I want to mention to you that there was a very important experiment of Faraday that uh, led to the idea that optics has something to do with electricity magnetism. And it's the following. If you take a very strong magnetic field and you pass a beam of light through it, what happens? What happens? What happens is basically that the polarization of the light changes in the magnetic field. So there must be some connection between optics and uh, electricity and magnetism. And that was a great experiment of Faraday and I think all this feeds into this uh, amazing discovery of Maxwell which was then of course uh, experimentally verified also by, by Hertz uh, for radio waves. but. So, for wavelengths which are approximately 10,000 times longer than the wavelength of light, okay, uh, which is a few hundred nanometers, uh, these e equations of Maxwell, which I haven't written any equations here by and large, work. Okay. Now, what is the takeaway from this slide? The takeaway is that the interaction between electric charges is mediated by some fellow, by the electromagnetic wave, the electromagnetic field. In, when you do quantum mechanics, you learn that it's the photon actually that goes from one charge to another charge, right? But that's much later concept. But at least this establishes that there is some finite propagation of a disturbance ca caused by this charge to this charge. So this will act a little bit later than this one, okay? So this is the uh, one big step in the history of science. And uh, now we come to, I want to explain to you how Einstein somehow put all these things together and resolved many of the paradoxes, including the one uh, Newton was very worried about, okay? So just a very, uh, one slide of special relativity. It will be like that, okay? Just one slide and go ahead. Uh, so the implications of Maxwell's theory are that the speed of light is the same. Now, this is a very counterintuitive, okay? It's very counterintuitive. Uh, whether you run towards it or away from it. So, you know, if you have a beam of light and you run towards it or away from it, the speed of light doesn't change. That is not your experience, right? That's not your experience. But light travels at the speed of light. It's very, very fast. It's very high speed. So, uh, you don't feel this type of effects uh, in our daily lives. Now, the key point, therefore, because of this, is that space and time have to adjust themselves. They have to somehow adjust themselves. This is a very colloquial way of saying that there are transformations of space and time. Okay? Without equations, I want to explain to you that space and time start mixing. And uh, this, uh, <clears throat> this mixing is basically uh, given by a very simple uh, thought experiment. Uh, 
that suppose you have some observer actually moving a certain fast speed okay speed v with respect to her okay and he is doing an experiment that this is a beam of light that goes up and down up and down up and down some laser setup actually okay now what does she observe she doesn't observe up and down she sees light just goes here and here so light travels much longer for her than for him and therefore the intervals between various events over here for her will become longer and longer this is a fundamental prediction of the special theory of relativity the time is not the same for everybody you know i started my lecture saying that time is the same for everybody no if you are traveling near the speed of light you will feel it that if v is near c then this is near zero and therefore this this delta t prime is extremely large okay very long so this 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 uh, destroys uh, the first point of newton's uh, mechanics that time is the same for everybody all right and that comes from the finiteness of the speed of light you all with me now i make one more point to you that uh, and this is a very great development in the history of uh, physics hermann minkowski who was einstein's teacher uh, understood this type of physics in terms of a geometry so now we are slowly moving to understanding space and time in terms of a geometry you see previously they were not uh, connected objects okay so hermann minkowski introduced this notion of elementary geometry you remember in your in your uh, geometry classes that you deal with distances between points with a plus sign over here right and this the triangle theorem i am deliberately not calling it pythagoras theorem because pythagoras had nothing to do with it it was first uh, most precisely stated in india okay that's another matter but i have to say these things <laughs> and uh, so this is the new geometry which minkowski introduced and uh, that played a very very important role in the development of the general theory of relativity which i will tell you a little bit about in very short time so now einstein was always puzzled by everything you see he was puzzled and puzzled and over many many years of work he was resolving these puzzles he really suffered discovering relativity so now <clears throat> einstein's puzzles newton's law of gravity in conflict with special relativity obviously because if there is a finite speed of light then this instantaneous business goes away there is something wrong with newton's law of gravity boom now the second question he was worried about was why only special relativity now special relativity means that you are basically discussing uh, events uh, uh, which are recorded by observers who are moving at constant speed with respect to each other why i mean why should you why should you not talk about the laws of physics uh, as you climb up to this institute from trivandrum which is certainly involving a lot of accelerations right so einstein actually raised this question and he uh, he postulated that the laws of physics uh, <clears throat> must be valid in any reference frame including those which are accelerating so what are those new laws of physics now that even gravity of newton is in trouble his uh, universal time is in trouble so you see in science there are no real gods actually even newton gave way to this because of experiments okay now so <clears throat> the resolution of einstein's puzzles lead to the general theory of relativity now i will not be able to explain to you all this in great detail but just get the flavor of it okay so <clears throat> in the general theory of relativity gravitational force is felt in a small neighborhood of space time the force felt in a small neighborhood of space time is understood in terms of acceleration of the frame and the force of gravity is not instantaneous now let me explain to you what this is it's very simple you remember if you sit in a car and you break you fall no in front now the main point of einstein and this is what he calls his happiest thought is that this falling when the car breaks 
is no different from the falling of this object in the earth's gravitational field. So he identified the force of gravity with accelerations. Okay, And uh, then of course uh, it took him many many years to formulate all this in a mathematical language because Einstein didn't know the mathematics actually that will uh, realize these physical principles. That's what this first point is. Okay, And the second point is that the as I said the uh, the special relativity mixes space and time in a linear way, but now general relativity will mix them in a non-linear way. This is just uh, uh, words for general coordinate transformation, but it's not important to what I'm going to say. So, just is one slide on what is the general theory of relativity. Okay, all right. So. <clears throat> I am not writing down these equations. The equations of general relativity describe the shape changes of the geometry of geometry or the fabric of space time caused by massive objects in which other objects move. All right. <clears throat> so, there is a little picture here, a little uh, animation. I will explain to you what, what this is physics wise. So, it says, I mean, this is a, a cartoon of a trampoline. Okay. So, it says if you have a very heavy object, like the sun for example or even the earth uh, then what happens is that it 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 warps the fabric of space time around it i can't explain to you really because you know i'm not you can't see me warping anything right and i'll explain to you why because it's all very stiff you need to be very big to warp space time in a noticeable way but if you have this warping, then uh, this uh, particle basically or this planet or this satellite simply follows a very simple uh, law in this geometry of space time. Okay. So, the gravitational field is mediated by geometry basically by curve, curving. So, a big mass curves the geometry and somebody else responds to this curved geometry. Okay. And this response is in finite time means it is not instantaneous. So, this is how Einstein explained uh, the law of gravitation. Okay. Uh, now, this is what I said and in general relativity that is Einstein's theory, uh, the space time grid is elastic, communicative and causal, but very, very stiff. So, I just wanted to say, I will come to it a bit later actually, how, how stiff, just, just try to make a guess in your mind, how stiff is space time. You know, I said it is something elastic, but you know, you do not see any such thing around, right. Alright, so now let us change the pace of, I mean the, 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 the chapter. What do I want to tell you now? So, I have given you a little rundown on the development of classical mechanics all the way with the intervention of Maxwell and Faraday all the way to Einstein's general theory of relativity. Okay. Now, now let us look at some physics issues. So, let us look at length scales in the universe. So, I have a little foot ruler here which, uh, which uh, you know enumerates uh, the the length scales actually which we discuss in physics from the very large which is 10 to the 28 centimeters. Uh, radius of the galaxy is uh, somewhere here between uh, a little bit more than 20, 10 to the 20. So, this is very, very, very large actually. Okay. And this is the earth sun distance. Radius of the earth, human being somewhere here and uh, this is the atom, the proton, etc, etc. So, I will Love. So, this is uh, Ernest Rutherford who discovered the scale over here and uh, here is uh, you know, the, this is the Hubble Deep Field Telescope that looks into space and uh, you know tells us about the physics and happenings in this region okay? and all of these astronomical objects, the telescopes and instruments. Then there is the microscope that looks at space time at a very, very short distance actually. Okay. And this happens at the Large Hadron Collider in CERN. And if you are lucky, if you want to visit this collider, this is the time to do it because uh, now they are uh, upgrading it. So, the accelerator is not working. 
If the accelerator is working, you can't go down to the pit. So this is a good time, this few months or a year or something that you can, if you have a chance, this is a fantastic place to really visit actually. Alright, so this is the super microscope that tells you about physics in this, this distance, 10 to the minus 16. It's much shorter than the size of the proton. Okay. Alright, <clears throat> now these are just, uh, I just said this, this is matter over here, this is V and there are molecules. Look closer into molecules, you have atoms, you look closer into atoms, you have the nuclei, you look closer into the nuclei, you have protons and neutrons and even closer, you find quarks. And you look even closer, you don't find anything else up till now, that's it, okay. Alright, so this is, this is some idea of the scales of length we are interested in, in physics. Actually, by physics, I mean physics, astrophysics, everything actually, okay, cosmology, I mean, there's the physical sciences. All right, so, all right. Okay, so now, now we come to, I think, one of the great chapters of uh, science, in the history of science, the real disruption of Newtonian physics comes from the discovery of quantum mechanics. And uh, you must you must know something about quantum mechanics that it uh, it is what makes uh, most of our devices work. Uh, it, it, it 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 is most its effects are most apparent uh, for very very small objects like uh, electrons and protons and quarks and all those. And the important point is that it is it has been experimentally tested to 10 to the minus 16 centimeters. See, this, this is amazing actually that there is no deviation from the laws of quantum mechanics actually up to this scale. Just I think the feeling for these numbers is very important. This is it's quite uh, mystifying actually. The, I mean it's very difficult to imagine this type of scales but try to. And this of course is the work of you know all these great Physicists starting from Max Planck to Einstein to Bohr, Heisenberg, Schrodinger, Dirac, Born, and, and of course thousands of others. Always there are thousands of other people whose work actually is the is what we call quantum mechanics today. All right. So this is the theory of the world, quantum mechanics. All right. Now so there is a problem. So I just want to tell you what I said before that we have had a journey from mechanics to electrodynamics and special relativity to general relativity to quantum mechanics. Now we go back to general relativity. You see. I told you that there is something called quantum mechanics actually that is really the laws of the theory of the world. All of chemistry uh, is uh, controlled by quantum mechanics. I mean there is no classical physics of chemistry or biology or anything like that. At the, at the small scale level, okay. All right. So, <clears throat> now what are the consequences of Einstein's equation? Back to Einstein's equation, there are some very important consequences. One is that the Einstein's equations predict black holes. I will tell you what they are. They predict gravitational waves and uh, they predict the ex expansion and acceleration of space time. So, these are three solutions of Einstein's equations and believe me, none of them Einstein really believed in. He did not believe in the existence of black holes. There was a problem with the horizon singularity. He did not believe in gravitational waves, though it is he who discovered this is his famous paper, but that they are so, the effect is so tiny, he said that they will never be discovered. But in 2014, they were discovered, you see, 100 years later. Yeah, and uh, he had a big problem with this uh, uh, this expansion of the expansion acceleration of our universe. So Einstein had lots of difficulties with the solutions of his own equations. But over the years, over the last uh, I don't know, I mean, since uh, you know more than now more than a century. Uh, <coughs> Uh, general relativity becomes a framework to discuss black holes, gravitational waves and cosmology and it's and there are enormous advances in theory but I want to emphasize being a theorist myself 
that experiments have played a very, very crucial role in all this. And it's very important actually, especially in India, that people, people value experimental science actually. You know, it's extremely important to work with your hands and do projects and uh, appreciate that all this uh, grand stuff has a basis in experiments. Okay. I'm also advising myself in <laughs> saying all this. Okay, so now let's look at the cartoon of the universe, the standard model of cosmology. So for that, I need to refresh some numbers here. Okay, so you see this is what we call the origin. We have no idea what happened here. We are talking here of times of the order of 10 to the minus 44 seconds. Okay. We have no idea what happened. Then what happened is that uh, after what is called the Big Bang, uh, the universe expands and inflates to 10 to the 30 times its size. This is the inflationary epoch. Means the universe expands, it creates space to about 10 to the 30 times its size. That's a huge inflation. And in a very short time it does that. Okay, so this is called inflation. These are all hypotheses which experiments seem to favor. Right? And <clears throat> within 100 seconds, matter starts forming. I'll just read it out from here because it's not in my head. And the temperature, which was a billion degrees, you know, uh, in one month, it has fallen to 10 million degrees. A billion to 10 million degrees. Okay, so the universe is basically cooling down, it's inflating, cooling, all right, so that's very important for it. I just wanted to um, give a feel of these numbers. And the cosmic microwave background spectrum starts forming about 400,000 years afterwards. So just... Uh, Very good. So, I was saying that this is the Big Bang and uh, approximately from our point of view, we can trace uh, using general relativity this time to be of the order of 10 to the minus 44 seconds. Okay. Then after the bang, the universe starts expanding. There is an inflationary phase okay, in which it starts cooling down. And uh, it cools down so that at this surface, which is approximately 400,000 years afterwards, the temperature is half the temperature of the surface of the sun. The surface of the sun is approximately 6,000 degrees centigrade. So this is approximately 3,000 degrees centigrade. Okay. Then, as the universe progresses, there's a lot happening here. I'm not going to talk about it, obviously. <laughs> this is the full thing. Uh, <clears throat> What happens is basically that uh, the uh, <clears throat> at this stage, if you look at matter actually a little bit before this time, uh, the matter is in a plasma state. Uh, plasma state means uh, charged particles are just flying all around. If you're in a plasma state, uh, you know, you, you know, light gets scattered and uh, you just don't see anything, right? It's just like looking at a cloud, you know, and the surface of the cloud is the surface of last scattering and after that is all transparent, right? So, what happens is that at this time, the universe is cold enough for matter to form neutral objects. Helium, hydrogen is formed, okay? And then, because this is then neutral, radiation is set loose at this temperature. And this radiation as it travels through the next several billion years, maybe around 13 billion years, is detected by us at the mean temperature of 2.7 degrees Kelvin. This is the cold radiation that permeates space-time. Okay, everywhere, anywhere it is there, you see it on your TV also. 
some percentage of that is the cosmic microwave background. So, this is a broad sketch and all the things that have happened over here. But there is one more thing I want to mention to you that there, there are these spots over here which are in the next slide. This is an amazing, this is, a, this is an experimental view and what is this telling you? It is a heat spots actually. These are heat spots, these are fluctuations in the temperature of the cosmic microwave background radiation, okay. These are fluctuations. Hot is red and blue is cold, okay. So, these are fluctuations. Now, as I have mentioned here, so this is a picture of the infant universe revealed to us in microwaves. So, if you can see in microwaves, this is what you will see. That's, that's the main point I am trying to make, okay. And there is a direct link between this picture and the quantum behavior of the early universe. So, um, so this is the picture I want you to have in mind. This, this is, this is, this is real stuff. I mean, this is experiments. I mean, this is the picture from WMAP, which has been made more precise by the Planck satellite, okay. And there are fluctuations. And these fluctuations are essentially between uh, minus 200 to plus 200 microkelvins. So, this type of measurements uh, lead to the question of what is the scale of the fluctuation actually, you know, if, if you want to see it. And uh, you can actually, people work it out and the scale is approximately a degree. Okay. So, the, 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 if you look at the uh, red and blue spots on the average, they are separated by a degree from the viewpoint of WMAP, the satellite or us. Okay. So, that, 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 that's the fluctuation scale, okay. Now, the question is, as I said before, that this is a map of the fluctuations, the gravitational fluctuations of the early universe, you know, which are imprinted in the microwave background radiation. Okay. And uh, here is a cartoon which I took off a uh, uh, talk of Lyman Page, who is a good friend of mine, that uh, <coughs> the gravity, gravitational landscape near the surface of decoupling. Is, this is a cartoon actually, you know, it, it, it forms some potential well and the potential will fall in all these particles and they keep on oscillating. So, those that fall over here obviously are more dense and they are hotter than the ones which are away and more colder. So, this is the, uh, the explanation behind the fluctuations in the cosmic microwave background radiation which is related to temperature fluctuations which you can show with some simple models are also related to density fluctuations of matter, okay. All right. And uh, as you know that Peebles got the Nobel Prize and he was one of the theorists actually behind this entire endeavor of understanding the universe actually from the cosmic microwave background radiation experiments. All right. So, and here it is and this is the plot everybody sees in the newspapers, but this is the one degree I was talking about. This fluctuation maps in this diagram, which is a plot of multiple moments, you know, as you look at the sky against the density of radiation and this is the famous uh, plot which uh, has been verified. There are big, big stories behind this, but you just look at this and want to know more about it, you can go and see it home when you go back. All right. So, this tells you something about uh, also some you know, amazing consequences about the energy budget of the universe and this is, we are just over here. All the matter that we know, atomic matter or whatever we are made of and have experience with on earth is simply 5 percent of the total budget of the universe. These are important questions of fundamental science. Where does this come from? Where does this come from? Important problems for you to worry about. What and this is the most difficult one actually. So, I, I will not, uh, I have a long way to go for you. <laughs> so, now let me just make the final statement that the seeds of observed galaxies are tiny density fluctuations at the surface of last scattering, which is this uh, plot, this uh, photograph I showed you 
of the cosmic microwave background radiation fluctuations uh, which are in turn imprinted by fluctuations of quantum gravity during inflation. Now this is a very important statement because it tells you that uh, firstly these fluctuations which are seeded around 400,000 years after the Big Bang, these fluctuations are the seeds of our galaxies because you see if you have a density clump somewhere, gravity being attractive it will attract more matter and more matter and this is how the galaxies are formed, this is how. So in a sense we are all here because of these fluctuations in the cosmic microwave background radiation and their origin and source is fluctuations of gravity. This is the first point I wanted to make in this talk that there is a experimental imperative for us to understand quantum theory of gravity even though it does not do anything for us uh, in our daily lives. I mean it is a scientific question actually where we come from. This, this is the slide that uh, I want to say that anyway. So in summary uh, quantum gravity is needed for the large scale structure of the universe. Now you will say okay I mean great so we have Einstein's theories now. So let us uh, apply quantum mechanics to it and then we will meet with a disaster because uh, Einstein's theory has a problem with quantum mechanics and this is the big question of modern physics that uh, how do you reconcile Einstein's theory uh, which is so good for the large scale structure of the universe uh, and uh, has a problem when you look at the quantum version of that because the real theory of the world is the quantum world not the classical yeah, not the classical laws. Okay, so this is our this is my first uh, submission to you that it is important to do quantum gravity and there is an experimental imperative for that. I am not, not talking of all types of other reasons why of beauty and this and that forget it this is the thing this is experiment. Okay, so this uh, is the first part. How long? How long? A little bit over time is okay. You're not you're not bored. Okay. Okay. Ah, okay. Good. <laughs> All right. I'm happy to hear that. Okay. Very good. So now I turn to the next uh, prediction of Einstein's equation. So let me explain to you about black holes. Uh, so Einstein's equation has a solution which is a you know there is something called a black hole solution I means there is a metric actually of a formula for a metric uh, and this is the cartoon of that metric okay. Now this uh, particular solution which Einstein <laughs> did not believe is correct okay uh, has a uh, has a has two very special features. One is that it has a horizon and the other one is has a singularity okay. Now just let me play this animation all right. So you if you are outside the black hole you will simply fall into the horizon because the you know the gravity will attract you and just take you in and the important point is that this surface is a surface of no return. Even if light falls in, it cannot come out. That is why you call it a black hole, okay, right. And there is a singularity over here that is where the curvature of space time becomes uh, very, very high and blows up. And uh, within classical physics or even elementary quantization of Einstein's equations, you cannot resolve this singularity. But that is another chapter I do not want to talk about it. Okay, and these are some of the players. This is Schwarzschild who found this solution while fighting in World War I. This is Oppenheimer. This is Subramaniam Chandrasekhar uh, with a photograph of Sir Isaac Newton placed on the four volumes of the Principia. I took this photograph. So <laughs> I am from the University of Chicago. So, <laughs> well, uh, wonderful to have Chandra come and pose. Uh, Firstly, he was extremely hesitant to come and stand near Sir Isaac. 
<laughs> then, then he did agree, and this is this is this is a classic horror actually of uh, Shaker. Okay, so this is what a black hole is, and uh, why should we worry about black holes and all the problems they create? Well, it's there. So <laughs> this this is the famous picture from the Event Horizon Telescope. You know, this is a supermassive black hole and its shadow in the Miser 87 galaxy in this cluster. Whatever. This was an incredible search by amazing. Uh, network of uh, optical astronomers all over the world with amazing software written for it all that combined this picture. And what is the most important point of this picture? The most important point is this. What does is, what is, what is this mean? That in the line of sight, I get no light. That's the key point. All this light that you see around is actually very complicated because, you know, I mean, because uh, if you look at the equations of photons in the presence of the gravitational field, I mean, it's not that it's just shining and coming towards you, no. They are zooming around, they are falling in, they are coming from behind. So, this, this, this is complicated stuff, but it's not of great interest to me because it, the most important point is that this, this object actually. Uh, does not emit any light in the direction of sight. So, I do not observe. That, that is the black hole. It is there, right? So, I have to study it because nature has it. You know, many years ago, I used to give these talks and be very apologetic about black holes. Maybe they are there, maybe they are not there. You know, there is a lot of astrophysicists feel this way, that way. Now, it is not a problem. It just sits here. So, <laughs> there is also very good indirect uh, Hey, what happened? Wait a minute. Ah. Indirect evidence for black holes actually came a little few years before, you know. And this is the, you know, this uh, famous, uh, what is happening? Oh, the animation is not working. It's like, oh, so sorry. You see, this is basically two black holes, uh, you know, very big uh, black holes, uh, you know, going around, circulating around, emitting gravitational waves and then coalescing into another big black hole. Okay, and uh, <clears throat> uh, the description of this whole phenomena uh, is done entirely within the context of the general theory of relativity. There are these 10 classical equations, actually 16, but they become 10 uh, equations of motion, and uh, people have solved them using numerical relativity and numerical techniques and all these things. And it all fits in well with the idea that Einstein's equations have black holes emissions. Okay. So, this is an indirect way of looking at it. All right, this, I am very sorry, this animation did not come through. But, okay, never mind. You can imagine what I was trying to say. <clears throat> so, till now, we are discussing the classical physics of black holes, right? We started, we did uh, classical physics, came to general relativity, then I told you about uh, quantum mechanics, then we went back to general relativity, discussing its solutions. One solution was the expanding universe and how Einstein's theory actually fails to explain uh, the, uh, the fluctuations of uh, the cosmic microwave background in a complete theory. And then now we discuss classical black holes. Now let us introduce quantum mechanics again and see the fun. So in quantum mechanics, black holes are not really black actually, they are hot and they emit radiation because of the presence of the horizon. Now, this is the famous discovery of Stephen Hawking actually. And he calculated the temperature of the black hole. Uh, this is Hawking's famous formula and actually on his gravestone, this formula is there. The temperature formula of the black hole in terms of its mass and the other fundamental constants. So, now let us uh, let us have a little fun with this formula. So, uh, it tells you that if you have a certain mass black hole, then this would be its temperature. So, for example, if you put in here this mass of the sun. So, can somebody tell me what is the mass of the sun in grams, let us say kilograms, grams. Great. So, you plug it in, 
you get this number. See, 10 to the minus 7 Kelvin, very tiny temperature. Then suppose you take the mass of the earth, which is a million times less than the mass of the sun, right? So you get this temperature. You take the ratio, it's exactly a million different. And you take a mass of the order of 10 to the 18 kilograms, which is very, very high. But then the formula tells you the temperature is about 7000 degrees Kelvin. So just to give you a feeling for Hawking's famous formula. Okay. Now, hot bodies have energy in the form of heat, which is measured by a quantity called entropy, right? And uh, Bekenstein and Hawking have this famous formula that the entropy of a black hole is proportional to the area of the horizon. See, I told you the horizon is a surface. You go in, you cannot come out. No? So that surface is there. It's characterized by surface of no return. So you take the area of that surface and uh, the entropy is proportional to the area. This is this is also a very famous law. It's called the Bekenstein-Hawking relation. I, I would love to tell you about all this in great detail, but we just have a Sunday here. So, all right. Now, now, now there's a problem. So what is the fundamental problem with Hawking's calculation? Hawking's calculation has a problem, just like Newton's theory had a problem. Hawking's calculation has a problem. And clearly it is wrong. Of course, I mean, it's right, but uh, it is wrong for some reason, I'll tell you. So, like all hot bodies, black holes radiate. Of course, you know, you have a hot body, it radiates and cools off, right? So there's radiation. And, uh, however, this creates a problem. It radiates and the radiation is thermal radiation actually, you know, featureless. Okay, this is a very important point. It's featureless. It's near, nearly black body radiation, nearly. Okay, so now the point is that the black hole forms. Now, you know, you want to form a black hole, you collide two huge uh, clumps of matter, you do all types of things. You can make black holes by accreting. You can do many, many, many ways of forming black holes and uh, thank God they exist. We are sure they exist. And, uh, <clears throat> but the evaporation according to Hawking's uh, theory uh, is uh, always in the same way. They, there is no memory of the formation. You see, however I form it, it evaporates into thermal radiation, which is featureless and therefore there is information loss. Now, there is a problem with that. I will come to it in a minute. Okay, so this, this is a little bit about black holes satisfy all the laws of thermodynamics. So, this is a good entropy, this is a good entropy formula and uh, this is a detail. Let me go on. <coughs> And the main point is information lost by Hawking radiation is not allowed by quantum mechanics. So this is the problem. This is a problem which uh, theoretical physicists have been grappling with since 1974, which is the year in which Hawking's paper appeared. All right, and <coughs> clearly there is a contradiction between uh, information loss, as predicted by Hawking's Hawking calculation. So what did he miss? We have to figure out. And uh, quantum mechanics. Okay. So, all right. Now you don't jump up and down if uh, you know if some chemical burns off or some piece of wood burns. You don't say there's a violation of quantum mechanics. There's information loss, right? So all the molecules that made that piece of wood, their shapes, everything is gone into smoke, but you can actually in principle trace back everything because this block of wood is described by a unitary theory, a Hermitian Hamiltonian, all the laws of chemistry are good quantum mechanics laws. So there is no information loss. I can detail all this, but I just want to say uh, that there is no problem with quantum mechanics. Okay, so this is the problem. <laughs> what do you do? So, information loss is uh, not something which is uh, unusual because we always work in statistical mechanics, right? We are talking about coarse graining degrees of freedom so that we don't know the detailed behavior of everything, but we know average behaviors, right? 
and we have measures to discuss average behaviors like temperature, like entropy, like pressure, like volume, right? all those things you learn in thermodynamics. The question is that we have a good thermodynamics of black holes, okay, they satisfy all the laws of black holes, everything. This is all within classical general relativity that uh, black hole thermodynamics is a good theory. But is there a quantum theory of gravity in which the black hole entropy, the Bekenstein Hawking formula I showed you, can be written in terms of another famous formula, which is Boltzmann's formula. Now you know this from your elementary statistical mechanics course that the, this is the famous formula. It is on the grave of Boltzmann that uh, the entropy is equal to the logarithm of the number of available states of the system. Okay. So, this is a fundamental formula of uh, physics. And the question is whether this formula of gravity follows from Boltzmann's formula. And if it follows from Boltzmann's formula, you have a good hope actually that uh, we may be able to resolve this information puzzle. Okay. And uh, <clears throat> Immediately, because of this, it raises the question, what are the internal states of the black hole that would account for the entropy, right? The moment you say that I want a formula like Bekenstein Hawking is equal to log number of states, what are those states? Okay. So, that is a very important question to have asked actually. And uh, well, yes, what are the, and, 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 and that would account for the black hole, all right. So now, we have actually arrived at two problems. One is the problem given by cosmology about quantum gravity. And now there is a problem given by black holes actually about the, the problem that arises from Hawking's calculation. So what do you do? I mean, you know, there is, there is a problem. How do you solve this type of problems? You need a good theory of gravity. And you know that Einstein's theory has a problem with quantum mechanics. So what do you do? So this is the problem which people in the subject of string theory are trying to address. Okay, this they are not doing things which are just haywire or you know some uh, some little mathematical stuff here and there. No, they are addressing foundational questions in physics, actually. and these questions are so difficult that then you do go a little bit astray in your trips. And then you have to come back to solving these problems. Okay, okay, so. Now, let me, so this is the conclusion, the large scale structure of the universe and black holes both require a quantum theory of gravity and gravity cannot be quantized in the standard way. So, Einstein's equations are a long way, are a long wavelength approximate manifestation of the underlying theory. So, the main question I was posing, what is this underlying theory? The situation is similar. Now, let me give an analogy to hydrodynamics, which is, uh, you know, hydrodynamics, you know, water, it's a, uh, when you wash your hands every morning, you don't feel anything grainy, right? It's all smooth and flowing and all that, right? So, it's described in terms of very few variables like velocity, density, etc. So, you write down equations of hydrodynamics. You describe water at a certain scale. But if you start looking at water with the eyes of a chemist, you find that water has a molecular structure, very complex molecular structure. There's about more than 60 phases of water actually. All right. So, but <laughs> in everyday life, uh, as you watch the streams over here, you don't see that this type of structure is there, right? Because you don't have the microscope to see it. So, so the analogy I gave is uh, to raise the basic question, you know, what is the hidden structure or what are the atoms uh, of space-time, you know, which at very long wavelengths look like a smooth geometry. So, that is a very valid question, right? Because we know that if we know the fundamental microscopic structure, then we have a good theory. Like you take Navier-Stokes equation or its relativistic generalization, you cannot quantize it. This makes no sense. I mean, you, you can attempt that actually. That, but if you recognize that water has a molecular structure, certainly you have a quantum theory of that, a good quantum theory. It is a very difficult problem, of course, in chemistry, but uh, people have worked on it for decades. Okay, so I just wanted to convince you that this is a good question to ask, 
and uh, the clue to the answer to this question essentially came from string theory actually. So, string theory I'll, I have not yet defined it for you, but uh, you see where I am getting. I do not want to define it. I want you to ask me actually what it is at the end that will solve all these problems. Okay, so <laughs> I have not told you what it is and for quantum gravity the most promising theory. I am not saying it is the only theory, okay. Uh, scientifically we cannot say this is the only thing and this is the truth. This is a framework, a good framework which can answer many of these uh, questions which conundrums that uh, I have actually thrown up and it can compute gravitational fluctuations from inflation hopefully can possibly provide a theory of the pre-inflation area which is what I think is a fantastic thing to understand and uh, it also provides new degrees of freedom besides the graviton that can account for entropy of black holes using the Boltzmann's formula. So, one very important takeaway this is more sophisticated but this is very simple that quantum gravity has more degrees of freedom than gravitons that is a take home. You never saw it but it is there it has to be there okay to account for the uh, entropy of black holes in a microscopic theory. So, that is a long story I want to not want to go into it and uh, this uh, there was this incredible uh, work by Strominger and Waffer that actually provided evidence for this type of picture I am telling you just now. What are those microstates in some model system and uh, then uh, the Hawking radiation part and the black hole thermodynamics can be worked out actually the statistical mechanics of this model and that was done by our group in TIFR by our colleagues in the United States and also other colleagues in the United States some time ago, this is some time ago more than 20 years ago, but this is part of the story ok. All right. Now, I am going to go 20 years ago and uh, uh, there was a big leap actually, I mean all leaps uh, look leaps actually if you are uh, not part of the history, but if you are part of the history uh, there are lots of people working on something and then one guy finds a very precise way of doing it. and then of course, it is uh, it's Juan Maldacena. So, the, the problem was that we are talking about quantum gravity all the time, right. But what the hell is it? Sorry to use that word. <laughs> what is it? I know Einstein's theory of gravity, but what is quantum gravity? So, Maldacena with insights from the work from the previous slide, especially the work on Hawking radiation and the microscopic theory came up with this holographic conjecture that provides a precise formulation of quantum gravity. So, I will tell you what that is, uh, I will, I, I took these uh, things from Juan slides. So, it is the following, the, the idea, let me explain what it is. So, Maldacena basically said that if you want to study gravitation, quantum gravity, full quantum gravity in the interior of a certain space time which has a boundary, now, technically this uh, is a boundary of a space time called antidecitor space, but do not worry what it is, it is a box, it is a gravitational box with a boundary, okay. Then everything you want to know about what is happening here can be calculated in principle in terms of the physics of this boundary which is a theory which has no gravity, which are the theories which are familiar with ok. The theories we are, we are all familiar with quantum field theory with current matter physics, many body systems, we know how to deal with uh, unitary theories in principle. So, this is, this is the uh, ADS-CFT conjecture you must be hearing about. Basically, the point is that on the boundary lives a unitary theory which is a holographic representation of gravitational physics over here, alright. So, uh, and I think at the physics, physics wise what is really going on is that if you have, if you have some piece of matter, okay, and you shine a light, okay, then this will block it, right. 
but if you if you throw you know if you throw a gravitational wave for example or if if you look at another object which has uh, which has gravity then there is no way of hiding behind in gravity you can't hide okay you cannot hide so the imprint of all the phenomena this is just a intuitive way of putting a very complex concept uh, is uh, is the fact that all these correlations or all the dynamics so the happening inside is coded in the theory on the boundary okay and uh, one more step then as soon as Maldasena uh, came up with this uh, fantastic idea the very famous paper it has some 17,000 citations or something whatever that means and uh, so Witten said that if you look at a black hole inside ADS space inside this space with a boundary then the physics of the black hole is all encoded in the thermodynamics or statistical mechanics of the theory living on the boundary. Okay, so we could have a lot of access to black hole physics and do a lot of calculations precisely because of this beautiful correspondence actually. And we also now understand that given this type of thing that if you want to study the formation of a black hole, the formation of a black hole is a problem in, in, in on the boundary. Uh, the problem is the problem of thermalization actually. How do complicated systems thermalize? So, which is a central problem today people are understanding in uh, condensed matter physics and statistical mechanics. Uh, the problem of thermalization because not all systems thermalize actually. Okay. All right. So, this is a this this is a <clears throat> great part of our story and there are thousands of people I mean I don't know generation last 20, 20 over 20 years people have been uh, looking at this formalism to make sense of quantum gravity okay. but I think uh, the labor door here still because the you have not been able to understand all the computations and one of the main problems is the the map between what is happening here to what is happening here the map is not obvious if it's obvious in simple circumstances but this map is complicated and it's very interesting that you know this type of problem in black hole physics actually has a has some overlap with uh, error correcting codes in quantum information theory okay so what i'm also trying to tell you is that this type of subject which deals with this type of framework has its fingers in all types of areas you see from condensed matter to mathematics to statistical mechanics to quantum information. Okay, so this is uh, more or less all the physics I wanted to tell you. Now let me tell you very briefly uh, a few of the interesting uh, results because every, every every theory must have something going which is interesting. Otherwise, why would you believe in it, right? So I just listed a few interesting uh, or important. Uh, consequences. So now this idea is actually of uh, black holes and quantum field theory were applied to this quark gluon plasma problem you know you, you take two heavy nuclei and you bang them against each other for a very short fraction of time the the quarks and all those fellows essentially gluons form a plasma okay is a plasma state and the plasma state is like a liquid it's a perfect liquid and its viscosity is approximated by this type of formula okay and this formula can be derived very nicely from uh, the type of physics i was telling you before it is very hard to do this formula in quantum chromodynamics in four dimensions so gravity helps you solve some important strong coupling problems in the boundary theory <clears throat> then there is a fluid dynamics uh, connection by my colleagues uh, at the Tata Institute and also elsewhere in the US. And uh, then there is this geometrization of computing entanglement entropy. See, entanglement entropy is a very important feature of quantum mechanics, right? That systems are quantum mechanically entangled. And this, and, uh, this uh, subject uh, got a new life using this ADS CFT correspondence of Maldasena that it became a subject in geometry 
I'm not going to explain to you all this now, but just wanted to make this point. And that is a fam famous formula by Ru and Takayanagi. Then this connection to quantum information, which I mentioned, then there are applications to quantum chaotic systems that there are these bounds on the Lyapunov exponent uh, in a quantum chaotic system, which can be derived using black hole physics and uh, very, very many interesting things are possible to do given this rather powerful formalism. Now, I, this is the last uh, slide, physics slide and I wanted to, I wanted to uh, tell you that what has been the progress on the information paradox, right? I said that's a major paradox, right? What is the progress? So, these are just, I have listed three things. I mean, there can be many others. Uh, it depends on uh, your inclination. But <clears throat> it solves the information problem in principle, right? There is no information problem in principle because, uh, you know, boundary theory, the theory on the boundary is a perfectly good theory. You just don't know what its uh, dynamics, how it sort of, you know, is uh, uh, represented in the interior. Okay, so you don't know that. So, the question is, uh, we do not yet have a convincing understanding of the resolution of the information paradox in the bulk or in other ways, other very, I mean, this is true statement, I'm not, uh, that where did Hawking's calculation go wrong? There's obviously something wrong, fundamentally wrong in Hawking's calculation. So, I think the main thrust of the works actually in these days have to do with pinpointing the problem with Hawking's calculation and of course in the in the process discovering some new principles actually of uh, the theory of gravity. And I think the most important work in this area has been done by Kiriakos, Papadogimas and Suvrat Raju. Suvrat Raju is a faculty member at the ICTS where I come from. <coughs> then how does one explain error correct? the error in Hawking's calculation and restored unitarity. So, there is a recent work by these authors, which is very beautiful, how a certain term has been sort of missed out by Hawking in the calculation of the entanglement entropy. Now, these people have worked in a toy model again, as physicists always do, but uh, I think there is very good uh, chance that this problem eventually will be resolved in some satisfactory way. And another thing is that the, the way we looked at the problem is that if you want to solve the information problem, why not study how black holes are formed in a toy model? So, this is what we did actually with uh, with uh, my colleagues and this is uh, Hardwaite is a student and Lata Joshi is a postdoc and these are all, others are all old men. <laughs> but <laughs> but uh, this is our sort of uh, direction and uh, I think uh, this also goes somewhere. So, now the next step in this uh, direction is to compute Hawking radiation from this uh, black hole that we understood formed. Okay. So, I am more or less to the end. This is the, I have been emphasizing this to you, that observations in cosmology and the fact that black holes exist require a quantum theory of gravity, which at large distances gives rise to general relativity. And I mentioned that string theory is a candidate framework that has the tenets to be a theory of quantum gravity. This is uh, what it will provide. I said this before also, but it's uh, redundant truth should not bother us that this framework is very important for cosmology and also for black hole physics actually. And uh, you know, this string theory framework uh, it is a new framework, a new way of looking at physical theory, which makes a connection between many parts of physics and mathematics actually, as I have illustrated to you. Okay, so now the last slide is something which I want to tell you about. I, I, I urge everybody actually to read uh, the Herbert Spencer lecture of Albert Einstein. It's the 1933 Oxford lecture. It's a, it's a, he debates the difference of point of view of Newton and himself. So it's it's a it's a fascinating lecture in the philosophy of science and the nature of physical theory. So there is only one uh, point over here which I want to emphasize to you that this the difference between Newton and him and he is very apologetic to Newton. Uh, 
the discovery of the laws of nature by logical invention. You discover it by logical invention based on general principles which can subsequently meet the test of experiment. Not experiment first and then the theory, which is what Newton was the guy who was doing that actually. He wanted to fit everything to the way he saw the world actually. And so, string theory carries forward this legacy because we are trying to do things by logical invention and mathematical consistency. And now and then uh, we do come across experiments like I showed you on the cosmic microwave background and black holes which make it imperative for us to discover the correct theory of quantum gravity. Okay. So, with those words, I just wanted to thank a few people here. This is the Infosys Foundation for taking care of me and uh, for the animations, Juan and Stan and Lyman Page for the slides and CMD and the various other internet sources. And thank you very much for listening. Hello, sir. Uh, you said that in uh, that slide x equal to k log n, n is a number of microstates. Available microstates. Available accessible states. For, but for a statistical system or in statistical mechanics, microstates are defined by the num the number of different ways a particular macrostate or a present state of the system can achieve. So what are what is mean by the internal states of the black hole? What about the present state of the black hole? So I'm treating black hole as just an ordinary object. Ordinary object. Yeah, just, just, uh, just stuff of matter, and that stuff of matter in string theory turns out to be d brains. You know, these are certain type of uh, solitonic configurations. You engineer them all, put together in some way, actually, and uh, then you form a almost uh, a loose bound state, and you compute the entropy of that bound state. Okay, not from that uh, Boltzmann relation. From the Boltzmann relation, you compute n from there. Okay, okay. Not by statistical mechanics. No, 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 no. You compute, uh, I mean, this is what I meant by statistical mechanics. You compute uh, using Boltzmann's formula, and Boltzmann's formula agrees with uh, Hawking Bekenstein formula. Okay. So, uh, that, that, so it, it, it gives credence to string theory that at least you could derive this formula actually in some special class of black holes. Okay. Thanks, first of all, for a beautiful talk. Uh, and uh, I would like to ask the uh, last question that uh, in one slide you showed something like a GFFT square is approximately equal to NIT square by uh, mass, uh, Planck mass. Square yeah, yeah, yeah. Then yeah. It is probably you want to, okay. That's, uh, I know where that is. This one. Yes. Oh, this is just some numbers I'm talking about. I mean, uh, how big is M Planck? Means what I'm trying to say over here, the M Planck is something like 10 to the 16 times 1 TeV, and the Large Hadron Collider, the energies are approximately 10 TeV only. So Einstein's theory is valid all the way to these short distances, but uh, you cannot reach this uh, Planck scale. I just this is a, a slide about scales actually, put in different ways. So there is a typical Planck length actually, which is 10 to the minus 35 meters, and this is the this is the length uh, and the associated time, which I mentioned in the beginning, 10 to the minus 44, comes from this one actually. In the, uh, the, the, the dividing this by the speed of light. Yeah. Yes. Uh, uh, you had uh, mentioned that in electrodynamics we have a finite uh, speed limit for particular information, and uh, from that, uh, uh, Einstein got the hint that uh, that speed is increased in gravity as well. So, uh, how do we say that uh, these, uh, both of these speeds are the same speeds? Ha, ah, it's a very good question. First answer is the experimentally verified by this uh, black hole merger. No, we, we have seen experimentally this is true. 
that's the first question. And secondly, in the formalism of general relativity, it is built in. That's the theory question, answer. 